Officials say the Memphis Police Department uses crime data to determine which neighborhoods to deploy the city's four Scorpion teams. But activists say special units like Scorpion, they tend to target low-income communities, conducting mass pullovers in those neighborhoods. Those units have proliferated in cities across the country as a kind of tough-on-crime strategy. But there have long been complaints about those special units. And in Memphis, residents sounded the alarm about Scorpion's aggressive tactics almost immediately. In fact, a Memphis man named Cornell Walker told the L.A. Times this weekend that days before that Scorpion team beat Tyree Nichols to death, this gentleman, Cornell Walker, was pulled over and accosted by Scorpion officers. Walker says Emmett Martin, that's the officer who is listed in the Nichols police report as the, quote, victim, that he was the man who pulled Walker from his car. The L.A. Times reports Walker said that when he and his friend, who were sitting in the friend's car, were first approached by the officers, they believed they were being targeted by young guys who wanted to steal their car. Walker said he saw Officer Emmett Martin step out of an unmarked police vehicle. I need to see your mother effing hands or I will blow your mother effing heads off, Walker said Martin screamed at him and his friend. Walker didn't realize they were police at first until he saw their badges and the word Scorpion on the back of their shirts. Martin, that's the member of the Scorpion unit, came over to their car and pulled Walker out, pointing a gun at his head from one foot away, Walker told the Times. The officer took him to the police car where the other officers also had guns out. Walker says he saw Martin, Justin Smith, and Demetrius Haley on the scene, and those are three of the officers charged in the Nichols case. I said, I just came over here to get a pizza, Walker said. He, as in Martin, didn't ever give a reason of why he pulled up on the car. That's Walker's car. Walker decided to call the Memphis Police Department and its Internal Affairs Unit the day after this assault. But the Internal Affairs Unit disregarded his complaint. Walker told the LA Times, the sergeant kept justifying it. I was pulled out at gunpoint with these people dressed as undercover cops. How am I supposed to feel? I didn't even know they were police. I felt like what happened to Tyre, Tyree Nichols was preventable. If internal affairs had taken action, it could have prevented it from happening, I believe. Cities across the country have special anti-crime units, just like the Scorpion unit. In Fulton County, Georgia, the unit is also called Scorpion, though they are now considering changing that name. In New York City, they are called G-I-V-E, Give, or Gun-Involved Violence Elimination. In Baltimore, it's the Gun Trace Task Force. Tyree Nichols and his death that has horrified the nation, and it has drawn attention to the work of these special crime units. So what happens now? Professor, I just, I want to start with your reaction to the story that is being reported in the LA Times from Cornell Walker, a man who sounds like he had, in some ways, a similar experience, at least at the outset, with the Scorpion unit. Absolute confusion, overly aggressive response, obviously a different outcome. What is your thought when you hear the details of his story? And Philip, I'll start with you. Yeah, so the details of the story are not surprising. They're not uncommon. If you recall, during the terroristic reign of Stop, Question, and Frisk in New York, there were constant stories um, that people wouldn't believe until there was videotape of it, um, until there was videotape of a young man who had been pulled over, Stop, Question, and Frisk three different times. Um, but these, these specialty um, sort of urban crime or gun or um, frequently the gang units will also uh, show up like this, they, they have a habit of causing incredible damage individually in terms of the community and then costing taxpayers a lot, a lot of money. Folks forget that the Rampart scandal in the 1990s in LAPD, that was the crash unit, which also had an acronym that sounded like something that would be good, but was crash. Cost uh, $125 million. The gun trace task force that you just mentioned in Baltimore recently cost Baltimore residents $13 million. Um, these are responses to uh, narratives of fear that black folks are coming, bad black folks are coming to do damage to you. But what usually happens is police do damage to those black communities, they end up paying out money, and yet they get celebrated as success. And all of it is in part because we only ask police to drive down the crime as if the way you drive it down is what you do afterwards, as opposed to using the data on where crime is happening to say, oh, those must be communities that don't have enough investment. 
they don't have enough resources so that we can give people the things they need so they don't have to cry out for crisis in crisis in the first place. And that, at the root, is the thing that actually reduces the crime. This unit was supposed to be dealing with, you know, homicides. I mean, this was supposed to be a violent crime unit. And the two anecdotes that I've heard from the specifically Scorpion unit in Memphis, one man who's sitting in his car with a friend getting a pizza, another man who's in his car and from the police chief is displaying no outward probable cause for the police to not only come at him, but to ultimately uh, kill him, to beat him, to do what they did that we saw well-documented on the body cam footage. So, like, what is happening that these specialized units believe they can take... The, first of all, they have the support of local law enforcement. I mean, there's a reason we played that sound from the mayor and from the police chief. This was seen as a successful model for Memphis. Why, why were... What, what strategies were they employing, and why were they seen as successful? It, you say, and I think rightly so, it is not a surprise that they were targeting innocent people like this. This is something that is documented, if not, if not at the center of the national media spotlight. Surely the higher-ups in law enforcement had to know that this was not a, a, a unit without blemish. Oh, I'm sure that they did. Um, I'm sure that the, I mean, as we've said, um, residents were absolutely saying, hey, we've had problems here from almost the jump of the unit. But part of the sort of giveaway is in the way the mayor touted the success numbers of arrests, numbers of felonies. We're evaluating law enforcement, but for the things that they can get away with charging people for, right? Not numbers of convictions, not numbers of folks who are in less crisis, not the metrics of actual safety, the metrics of punishment. And so long as all we've got are metrics of punishment, then for sure, law enforcement is gonna look like a huge success. But you got right to the core of one of the issues here, if the real reason to have a scorpion unit, and by the way, I don't care what the acronym is, if you have as a poisonous predator yes. as the name for the thing you're using state dollars for, don't think that's going to end up with a lot of safety going on, right? Wasn't it the scorpion who, who stabbed the, the frog and they all drowned in the river in the first place? Um, but if you've got um, a, a scorpion unit whose job it is to deal with the most violent crime, the murder spike that we saw during the height of the pandemic, there is no justification for low-level traffic enforcement. But the reason they're doing it in those neighborhoods is they know if they do essentially a dragnet through the neighborhood, they're going to get enough people with enough stuff in the car, they can charge them, the mayor can be proud of those numbers, mm -hmm. and the community can feel like they're being kept safe. It's a PR vicious cycle. So until we start actually asking questions about what does safety mean, and exactly as Janae says, and exactly as folks in Oakland have been saying, and folks in Chicago have been saying, and Philly have been saying, we got to use police for less for the things we could possibly train them for. And by the way, get them out of the things that they themselves have said they want out of, out of mental health, out of unhoused folks, and for sure, out of low-level traffic, which is both dangerous for the officer and, in this case, deadly for one motorist. Can I just ask you, that part of when we talk about what safety means, that's there's a generational divide on this. Is there not, Philip? I mean, especially in Memphis, the Atlantic has some great reporting on this. Older residents of some of these communities want to see a strong police presence. The younger younger members of these communities are, are kind of woke to this idea, and I don't mean that in a pejorative sense at all, but just they are aware of the, the sort of systemic abuses in the criminal justice system and in law enforcement, and they're much more wary of a heavy police presence or even a police presence in their neighborhoods, given their, their you know, the history here. I mean, it's a, it seems like it's, it's more complicated than just, you know, this is what safety means to this community, because that seems like a matter of debate. Am I overstating that? No, I mean, so I, I would add complication to your complication. Um, for sure, the polling says that, but I'm not sure the polling gets at the right question. Um, the reason why you have older black folks, and I'm now in, into that demographic now, um, who will say, yes, we want a, a police presence, is because not only have they been around for the slogan of defund the police, but they lived through defund the education system and defund mental health hospitals and defund uh, public safety uh, that comes in the form of <clears throat> uh, drug uh, issues and unhoused uh, uh, resources. They've been defunded so that the only thing they've got left that gets any municipal dollars are the police. Yeah. So if you take the police away, what they're saying is you have taken away literally everything and we have no faith that once you've taken money away, you will give it back in any form to these communities. They have lived through a kind of terrorism of disinvestment in their communities. So during the height of the 1980s when we saw, and 1990s when we saw a huge investment in law enforcement from what counts as the political left in this country, 
black folks weren't only saying we want tougher punishment for these folks who are taking over the streets. They were also saying, and we would love if you would invest in the community so we don't have to call out in crisis in the first place. We mostly don't tell that history. That message was mostly lost on politicians who were scared of talking about it. And then we are now at a point where we say, well, there, there must be a generational divide. There is in the experience of disinvestment. Younger mm -hmm. generations grew up amidst this disinvestment, and older generations, like me, have watched it unfold. So folks are more scared to give up any money that's coming into those communities at all. That makes absolute sense.